Good morning, Anne. It's okay to cross in front of the screen, just so everybody's not discouraged. Good morning. Welcome to the 2013 American Land Title Association Business Strategies Conference. It's really fantastic to see everyone here. I want to first start by saying a special thank you to First American Title Insurance Company. First American was the sponsor of our breakfast this morning. It was yummy. I like the bacon. I really like the uh, a, a support and appreciation that we get from First American for the industry and for our association and from all of our sponsors. So thank you for that. We designed this meeting to be about a hands-on, interactive experience for all of you. And I'm excited because not only is it hands-on and interactive for you in the audience today, but it's also interactive for those of us who are joining us live streaming. This is the first conference that the American Land Title Association is holding that we're live streaming. So those of you who are in your offices are able to join us and share the knowledge and experience that we're gaining from our general, general sessions. So thank you for that. I want you to walk away from this meeting with a list of ideas, and any of you who know me know I like lists. And I think that this is really a fantastic meeting because you'll learn so much that's very applicable to what you do in your offices every day, mostly from our sessions and our professional development sessions, I hope, but also importantly from your fellow attendees, from our vendors, from our sponsors, from the conversations that you have, so I encourage you to really spend a lot of time talking to each other, getting ideas, and learning about what people are doing in their businesses to make their business stronger, just like you're here to make your business stronger. I also want to talk, Camille, are we, can you help me with slides? I want to talk about different ways that we connect uh, with each other uh, at American Land Title Association. We don't want the conversation to just be here today. We want the conversation to continue. We're very active on Facebook, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn. So I encourage you to like us on Facebook, like the Title Action Network on Facebook, follow us and join our LinkedIn group, American Land Title Association. I also want you to follow us on Twitter and tweet with us. And I know many people have been. It was fun seeing people announcing that they're arriving in Oklahoma City. Uh, our hashtag for this event is hashtag ALTABSC, so keep the conversation going. I'm expecting tweets to happen during the general sessions and during the professional development sessions, so thank you for that. Another thing, it's hard when I can't see the slide. Another thing I want you to look at is downloading our app. So we have apps for all of our conferences. We have an app for business strategies that you can download right now from the App Store. It will give you your schedule, a map of the exhibit hall, it will give you a map of Oklahoma City, and a list of the convention attendees. So it's really a great resource both now and later when you're trying to figure out uh, which people you talk to in which states that you want to get back in touch with. So download our app. And I'm excited about this one. This is our QR code. You may have seen this code on signs around the exhibit hall and by the registration desk. If you scan our QR code with your mobile device, and everybody that's live streaming with us will see this online, you can scan the QR code from your screen. It will take you to a web page that has all of the proceedings from our professional development sessions and our general sessions. So scan the QR code. I don't see anybody holding up their phones. If you're good, you can do it from where you're sitting. It should work. So you can scan your QR code, it'll take you right there and you'll have all of your documents so that you can um, use those both while you're in the professional development sessions and then you'll have them later as resources. So thank you and a special thank you to my Alta staff for making this happen. Now I'm very excited to announce something that's very important to us as a trade association. Uh, the national title professional designation has been a dream of many of us in this room, and because of the hard work of our ALTA Education Committee and a few dedicated individuals, the National Title Professional designation is now a reality. So if we could take a moment and ask the members of the Education Committee to stand and thank them for their work on the NTP, please do so.
there's a lot of hours that went into this program, and in thinking about why we're doing this, I was really touched yesterday when Jim Stepanovich was talking to a group of first-time business strategies conference attendees about the national title professional designation, and he said, you know, I've really taken for granted the knowledge and the skills and the level of professionalism that's required in this industry. And when you think about it, what you do every day has a very high level of technical skills, of professionalism that's required in the way that you interact with your clients, in the way that you handle their information, in the way that you handle their funds. And I think it's fantastic that the board has been dedicated to promoting the idea of professionalism and providing an avenue for a designation that indicates and shows that strong skill set and professionalism in the industry. And so with pride, I am pleased to introduce to you the first class of national title professional designees. I'd like to call to the front Jim Stepanovich with Old Republic Title in Independence, Ohio, Ann Anastasi, CLT, CLTP, the Pennsylvania designee, of Genesis Abstract in Hatboro, Pennsylvania, and Jeffrey Bossy of Bossy Title Company in Evansville, Indiana. To each of you, I present your National Title Professional Designee pins, which is very cool. I hope you wear them with pride. And I would ask all of you to join me in congratulating these three individuals, as well as Joseph Gravas of Investors Title Agency in Edison, New Jersey, and Philip Janney of Plunkett and Grammar in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Congratulations. The pin. Nice work. Congratulations. Thank you. I can't pin it on. You can't shake hands. Congratulations. Thank, thank yes, you, yes, Michelle. Yes. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Sean, did you get a good picture of these uh, esteemed professionals? always good to have a photo to commemorate the moment. The NTP is a big deal and I hope that all of you take some time over the next two days to talk to them about what they had to do to go through their application process or to talk to members of the Education Committee about the application process because I think you might find that while the NTP is definitely a significant achievement, it's achievable by everyone in this room. So congratulations. Another initiative of the association designed really to highlight professionalism was the best practices. And I would like to take a moment to introduce our ALTA Board of Governors. And I'd like to ask all of our ALTA Board to please stand. I think most of them are sitting over here. So Frank, perfect. Thank you. Stay standing. So Frank. Herschel, where's Diane? Diane, Stuart, Steve, Chris, Rob, Dan. Take some time to talk to these individuals about the Best Practices Initiative because they have worked tirelessly over the last year on trying to find a solution, a product, and a tool. Frank wants to sit down. Please sit down. I always think it's good for everybody to be able to see you. They've really worked tirelessly over the last year of, of trying to find a tool that allows everyone in the industry to showcase the level of professionalism and the commitment and the protection that they employ in their businesses as they go out and take care of the real estate settlement transactions across the country. And I think that with the publication of the title insurance and settlement company best practices that the association has done that. It's a process, and the process has begun, and we are in the middle of the process now. And I encourage all of you, and I know that you're dedicated because you're here, to take time and have uh, more of a conversation about what you can do to implement the best practices in your business and to showcase the best practices to your clients and your customers. And so for the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to ask Frank Pellegrini to come to the stage with me. And we'll share a conversation with you and encourage you to ask questions about the best practices. Uh, Frank Pellegrini is the current leader of the American Land Title Association, is president of the Board of Governors. Frank is the CEO of Prairie Title in Oak Park, Illinois. 
He is an independent agent and, a, and an attorney. Uh, so Frank really brings a valuable perspective to the conversation. And I think that Frank's level-headedness has been much appreciated as we think about uh, how we've gotten to this point. And really what's happened is something that's very typical in the way the regulatory process works. There is a common understanding that there is a crisis that happens in our country, just like we've seen the crisis in uh, the housing collapse of 2008. And then there's a regulatory overreaction, much like a lot of what was in Dodd-Frank and kind of the sweeping nature of Dodd-Frank. But there's a desire among the regulators and the policymakers to do as much as they can to protect consumers, to prevent uh, economic disaster from happening in the, in the future. And uh, I think we all know that what happens is there's this, this pendulum swing that kind of goes all the way over to one side. And it takes some time before everybody really figures out where the right balance is and kind of where common sense prevails that allows for those protections, but also allows for businesses to thrive and individuals to interact in, in society. And so until we get back to that point of um, kind of reasonableness, I think that it's good for us to take real action to uh, own our own industry and what we do to protect our industry. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Frank for a few minutes. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, you know, I may be president, and notwithstanding my introduction, you, you, you have a sense now of who's really the boss. No. <laughs> she, she tells us when to stand, when to stand. <laughs> I do like to do that. <laughs> when to come up, you know. <laughs> but, but thank you. Thank you all for being here today and uh, for this conference. This is an exciting uh, uh, turnout here, and I think we're going to we're going to learn a lot. Uh, there's going to be you know a lot um, uh, uh, for us to talk about, and uh, a lot for you to think about. So welcome. Where the fact that you're here uh, means that you're engaged and involved and interested, and that's what we need in this industry. We need engagement, involvement, interest, and knowledge. As Michelle said, I just want to uh, briefly. Uh, mention what the best practices is intended to do. First and foremost, the best practices were designed for the members uh, and created for the members. Uh, the challenges uh, that were created were created by market demands, and those market demands were the result of regulatory pressure that, that uh, was exerted on the market. As uh, uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, the 2008 crash was not of our doing. We were certainly not the cause of the 2008 crash, and I spoke about this in, in Colorado Springs in October, uh, but to a, a great extent, and, and, and frankly, uh, beyond that, I think this industry actually put a floor under what could have been an, uh, an absolute disastrous crash uh, and collapse. Uh, so our industry, to a great extent, helped support uh, uh, against a, a deeper uh, crisis. But notwithstanding that, we are firmly uh, in the crosshairs and at the center of efforts to prevent that collapse from ever occurring again. And as my predecessor Chris pointed out many times, uh, this, our, our world is all about the consumer right now. So this is, these, these are, uh, regulators are very consumer focused, lawmakers are very consumer focused, the industry is becoming very consumer focused. These, uh, the best practices allow us the tools and the implements, if you will, to address those challenges. And by addressing those challenges uh, the way we, we intend to and the way we've, we've started out doing it, we've, we've turned those challenges into opportunities for us. They're, they're great market opportunities now. Members of our association who subscribe to the high level of professionalism now that, that, is, that, that will be set uh, by way of the best practices, will be will have a competitive edge over people that that uh, or, or companies that uh, decide that they don't choose to uh, live up to that level of professionalism. So, what we've done here, this is not something that, and I say this over and over again as I go around the country um, uh, talking about best practices. This is not something that we woke up one morning and said, "Let's do something." <laughs> this is this is something that that has that that screamed. Uh, for attention, and and this this association has has given it that attention and has responded uh, to the the needs, the market demands, the regulatory pressures, and all the all the forces 
uh, that have created the need for these best practices. So um, I think we're going to get into questions, and we're going to encourage you to, to uh, uh, ask your questions, be, uh, be candid, and we'll try to respond as best we can, and yeah. we'll take it from there. So while you're thinking of your questions, and there are a couple of microphones set up around the room, um, feel free to, to go over to the mics to ask the questions. Uh, I want to talk through some of the resources that we have for you at the Trade Association in trying to understand and break down and implement the best practices. Uh, everything that we talk about and everything that we do, we commemorate and we put up on our website. So if you go to alta.org forward slash best practices, you'll see a compilation of all of the articles that we've written about each of the seven pillars of the best practices. You'll see um, all of the uh, resources from webinars, from conferences, et cetera. So I encourage you, if you have questions on anything in particular, alta.org forward slash best practices. Every, there we go. Every Thursday, uh, you receive in your email inbox Title News Online, and it comes out Tuesdays and Thursdays. We are dedicating our Thursday Title News Online just to best practices. And every month, we're focusing on each of the seven pillars. And so within that month, you'll find the best practices around one theme with the idea that if you can you know, kind of really focus in on one area, make sure that you've got everything uh, that you need in place, it's an easier way to eat that elephant. Uh, we also have provided some checklists for you to use to think through what you've got to think about and do in your companies. And I think the checklists are very helpful. I've been getting great feedback on the checklist because so much of the best practices you're really already doing in your businesses, but you probably don't have it organized in any kind of a formal way. You, you probably have policies on document retention, but it's likely in somebody's head. And the important thing is we've got to get it out of these people's heads and onto paper. And this is really what this is about. So use these resources that are available both in the Thursday emails and online in the checklist to help you kind of work through that process. On, I can't remember which day of the week it is, Jeremy. Jeremy conducts a title topics webinar once a month. And this has been a real fantastic tool. And we've had a lot of fabulous participation and interaction on our title topics webinars. These topics will also mirror the theme of the month as far as which one of the seven pillars that we're participating in. But we've also archived all of the title topics uh, webinars on our website. And so if you search for title topics on the Alta website and in the best practices page, you'll find other strong resources. But I encourage you when you see those emails coming in about these, these webinars to take some time and get the members of your staff that relate to whatever the particular subject area is to participate in these, these webinars. And with that, here are the seven pillars. Any questions Did, so far? What can we? They're obviously very plain and clear because okay. no one has questions. Well, let, let me uh, let me interject uh, some some uh, experience here. Uh, when we talk about the best practices being in response to some regulatory pressures that, that have been put on us and some market demands that that, that are that are um, that have been created, uh, these are the realities that that we face. We cannot change those realities. As I've said, you know, you, you can't change the wind. But all you can do is adjust your sails. The best practices will allow us to adjust our sails appropriately to navigate through these winds that we face in terms of the regulatory world and market needs world. We were in, in uh, Michelle and I were in, well, Michelle is always in Washington, D.C. I was in Washington, D.C. in December, and we met with Director Cordray. And it was an incredibly productive meeting. We met for an hour, uh, just four of us, Michelle and I, uh, the director, and, and his uh, director for external affairs, I believe is who, what her title is. Uh, and we, we, we had an opportunity to talk about the best practices and, and uh, how they came about and, uh, and, and some details about the best practices. And, and the director uh, was uh, very enthusiastic about the fact that this is the way regulatory initiatives should look. This is how they should look. It, it, this is an industry solution uh, to uh, a very broad uh, issue, and uh, and he was very very uh, enthusiastic and supportive 
of, of the initiative and thought uh, that this is a, a good way for our industry to, to conduct itself uh, in light of that. Anne. I think that the lending community that we've heard from, and we've heard from uh, some very large lenders, of course, they, 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 they have been very supportive. They think this is the right direction. This is the way to go. Of course, you know, we have to now, we, we have the framework. We have the skeleton up. Now we have to put, we have to put uh, the sheeting on the outside and get, get, mm -hmm. uh, get the house built a little bit better. But we have, uh, we have a very good uh, framework yeah. to, to, to go from. And I think what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of this is in reaction to, and the lenders are, are trying to figure out how to meet the regulatory requirements that they've, they've, um, that they fall under from their regulators. And they don't really know necessarily yet what's the right thing to do. And this is why I really encourage everybody to go out and talk to your lenders about what their thoughts are on the proper ways to fulfill their obligations. So one of the things that regulators have said to lenders, and this has been uh, a guideline that they've had in the past, but it's really come to light after the 2008 hous housing crisis with a lot more teeth, is that lenders are responsible for all acts of their third-party service providers. And they're responsible for those acts really regardless of whether or not they've told you to do something and you do something different. And so that really puts an increased pressure on all of us as third-party service providers to make sure that we're letting them know that you're doing the right thing and that you have the checks and balances in place to make sure that you're meeting those standards, meeting the law, meeting the protection standards that are necessary. And that's really what the best pillars are designed to, or the best practices are designed to do in the seven pillars is to show in a very concrete way the different practices that you have in place to meet the requirements so that the lenders have concrete information, and this is also good for consumers to have concrete information about how your business is protecting the transaction and in a way protecting them. And so while they're trying to figure out what their obligations are under the regulations, I think it's very good for you know, all of you to go to your lenders, talk to them about what you're doing, talk to them about the best practices, see if this is something that meets their expectation. And I think that um, in most cases, you'll find that it is. And I would be, we're all very interested to hear if there's um, variances in what they're thinking and what they feel their obligations are. Third-party settlement providers represent a distribution network, a network of delivery of, of very important services. They are also the, the holders of some very important um, pieces of, uh, uh, of details uh, that in involve uh, the transactions that they handle and uh, involve the consumers that they serve. So we, we have this network uh, of delivery, of service delivery, and, and that's a, a network that works very well. However, um, the lenders uh, and our customers are saying to us, we're, we're delivering to you some pretty important things. And I, I break it down into three very important items. Number one, they give us a whole lot of money. It's their money, but, uh, funding consumer loans and transactions. They give us a whole lot of money. Number two, they give us some very important transactional instruments, some, some very important transactional documents that evidence interests in, in real estate and, and the uh, homes that people are buying and the, and the properties that people are investing in. And finally, they, they place with us some very important information about the consumers that we represent ultimately. So we have a whole lot of money, we have important instruments, and we have some pretty sensitive information about folks. That's that non-public personal information that we talk about all the time. So lenders are saying, well, we're, gonna, we're handing you all this stuff, and we really, we really like this whole distribution network that we've got going. We like the way it all works, but we're giving you all this stuff, but, we, but then when we give it all to you, we need to know who you are. We need to know if you have the capacity to handle this important stuff. We need to know whether you have the knowledge to, to deal with it. And we need to know that you have the integrity to, to carry out those important functions that you serve. So lenders don't want us to disturb that, that web of service delivery. That, that works terrific. That's a, that's a great 
uh, uh, framework to, to deliver settlement services. But our regulators are telling us that regardless of what we do with that money and the information and the documents, we're going to be responsible in the, at the end of the day. So we need to know a lot more about you. Here's, the, here's how yeah. that here's I always like when you talk about it in terms of those three really important things. And I think it's interesting when you think about what Jim said on taking for granted so much of the skills and professionalism in the industry. I think we've really taken for granted the what's been entrusted to everyone in the transaction. And so this is making sure we're not taking that for granted. That's, right. That's um, a good word, too, entrusted. Yeah. yeah. And I think that you know when people talk about the best practices, let me talk for a minute about um, the non-public personal information, because this seems to be one of the pillars that scares people the most. I don't know if scares people is, is the right thing, but it's maybe the toughest to break down. So the third pillar is really about everything that you're doing to protect that information and your data, both from a physical security and an electronic security standpoint. And a lot of this, most of it, is really encompassed in Graham Leach Bliley's regulations and responsibilities. And I think that you'll find if you really start just kind of looking at each part of the pillar, there are fairly reasonable ways and easy ways to make sure that you're um, complying with all of those aspects. And the technology committee has been working for the last few months on coming up with a guidance on the pillar. And it's not really a how-to manual, but it's more of a how to you know, kind of break it down and what you're supposed to think about to make sure that you're doing in each of your offices. So I know everybody doesn't like when I do this, but if the technology committee could raise their hand <laughs> or stand, that would be good. So Pat, great. So go and find uh, these individuals that are serving on the technology committee, because they've been really spending a lot of time with this. And I don't know if any of you want to talk about um, some things that you've learned in the process that have been really helpful that you want to share with the group. Pat did a great job yesterday at the agent and abstractor forum, talking to about 50 individuals uh, through the best practices. And he said that they were really their, their test case of uh, asking, you know, this is how this is. Does this make sense to you? And I think you got a lot of really good feedback from, from people about things that they didn't quite understand or other things that you could offer that would be useful. Pat doesn't want to talk about it. It's all right, Pat. Don't worry about it. Is there? Yeah. Well, we're running short on time, so I encourage a question. Uh, if we don't get a question pretty soon, the pop quiz will be administered. Good. <laughs> we're going to take the slide off. You're going to have to list all the best practices in, in proper sequence. Good. <laughs> so the rest of the uh, professional development sessions. Go ahead, Pat. Members. Yep. Then we've got the people that aren't members. So just throw the numbers out. Say there's 15,000 title companies or settlement agents. Half of them are ALTA members. We've got another big group of folks. How are? What's the big picture for that? We've got states that are trying to implement best practices. NAIC. How does it all work together? And is there a global plan of attack for best practices? A global plan of attack it makes it sound like we're very thoughtful and scheming. Uh, we're not. So uh, that's really the benefit and the, the purpose of association. So we all come together and support association and do what we can to better the industry. And the association has published the best practices as a standard that's out there for everyone to use. So we want everyone to look at the best practices and determine how they want to use those in their businesses. The clients, the lenders will look at those to determine whether or not this is something that they want to see met uh, as a um, condition of their relationship. Um, different providers are going to look at this and see if this is something that they want to do, as something to offer up to their clients. And so it's really an individual company basis. And I think that as we watch all of this um, evolve, again, remember, we're dealing with the pendulum of uh, kind of the, what's the regulatory requirements. And we don't know where that's going to um, completely fall. And so as we watch this all evolve, I think you'll see different groups um, adopting and using the best practices potentially in different ways. And you know, all of that is a good thing. So if there's a master plan, the answer is no. Well, it's intended as an industry initiative, of course. However, the resources will be exclusive to members. And so if you're a member of Alta, you're going to be able to, yeah. to take advantage of, of the great resources that we will provide uh, to, to 
work uh, along the guidelines of best practices and work with those tools a little bit easier. But it's an industry initiative. This, this is something that should, that should span the entire industry, all the members and not all the members. Good. So the rest of the uh, professional development sessions are really focused on taking apart the best practices bit by bit. Uh, I hope I'll see all of you in those different sessions and that you get a lot out of it. And remember, the proceedings are all available if you scan our QR code. So if you can't go to one uh, that you wanted to go to because there's another that you prefer to attend, uh, you still may be able to pull down that information and, and talk to people that have attended those sessions. So thank you for this. I'm glad to see that there's not a lot of questions, which makes me feel like everybody understands what we're doing. So you did a nice job, Frank. Thank you. Oh, you did a nice job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also very excited uh, to introduce our next speaker, and I think that with everything that we're talking about, uh, all of this is really a change in the industry, and uh, sometimes, sometimes change is hard. And I think Ira Blumenthal is going to be fantastic, and frankly, a friend once told Ira, slow down. You're so busy, you're going to burn out. And Ira simply replied, it's better to burn out than to rust. <laughs> Ira Blumenthal moves too fast to ever rust. Considered a modern-day business renaissance man, Ira Blumenthal is the president of Co-Opportunities, Inc., an Atlanta-based consulting company that has counseled world-class clients such as Coca-Cola for over 20 years, Nestle, Delta Airlines, Exxon, Walmart, Disney, Harris Entertainment, United Artists, McDonald's, Kroger's, and others. Ira is a published author. His first book, Ready, Blame, Fire, focuses on the myths and myths and misses. That's a very tough thing to say, Ira. Myths and misses in marketing. Uh, he's also the recipient of the coveted George Washington Honor Medal for Literacy Excellence from the Freedoms Foundation. His second book, Managing Brand You, is hugely successful and is about personal branding. Meeting with great acclaim, it is also published in Chinese. The former host of a popular radio talk show, Success Talk, Ira has interviewed guests Success stories such as General Colin Powell, Mario Andretti, Tommy Lasorda, and other notables. Ira has also served as a visiting instructor at the University of Notre Dame and Michigan State University. You may have to explain that. And in 2012, Ira was honored by being named executive in residence at Kennesaw State University. Ira has been quoted and featured in media sources such as the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, CNN, Brand Week, Entrepreneur Magazine, Executive Excellence, People Magazine, Marketing News, and others. On a personal note, Ira is a tireless community activist and a youth coach. In his own youth, he was a World Cup athlete, as well as a collegiate football and lacrosse coach. Originally from New York, Ira resides in Atlanta, Georgia, with his redhead bride, Missouri bride, Kim. He's the father of two daughters and three sons, and has two grandsons. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming Ira Blumenthal. You know, before I start, that was an incredible eulogy. <laughs> that guy Ira was a hell of a guy. May he rest in peace. You know, folky futurist Bob Dylan once wrote, there's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll shake your windows and rattle your walls. What's the next line? Ah, the times they are a changing. But, you know, before we even go into this, okay, I've got to go back to Frank and Michelle for a second. You know, when you introduced and you talked about how she, you know, she's really in control. One of my grandkids, I have two grandkids and I have two on the way. By the way, I went to, for the first time in my adult life, my son and my daughter-in-law invited us last Sunday to go to a gender reveal party. Have you heard about this? You have. 45 people were drinking wine, were having, and then my daughter-in-law, Brittany, says, it's time for the gender reveal. And they cut a cake open, and it was blue inside. <laughs> the times they are changing. But no, you talked, you talked about Michelle, okay, Frank, you talked about, you know, being in charge. When my, um, my 13-year-old grandson was five years old, he came back from Sunday school. And he said, I learned a lot today, Grandpa. And I said, what's that? He said, I learned who's in charge of the world. And I said, yeah, Jonathan, that's great. Who is in charge of the world? And he said, God. 
And I thought that was really, really cool. But I'm kind of a sarcastic, sardonic, you know, a marketing guy, you know. And I said, well, who's in charge? Who's the boss of God? And he said, his wife. <laughs> Which, th there we are. And also, too, now, Michelle, okay, you, you know, the, the worst thing about having a, someone open in front of you is you change all your remarks. Now, you talked about how, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you say you wanted everyone to go home with a boatload of ideas? Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Can I take it the next step? Take it the next step? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, at this marvelous ALTA co conference, okay, I don't care if you have 172 ideas. The key is not the idea. The key is what you do about it Monday morning, 9 a.m. That's the big goal, okay? And whether it's one idea or a boatload of ideas, pick one and maybe change a behavior or revisit a behavior or maybe, you know, in, in be inventive, innovative. That's critically important, okay, the key. Uh, you also, you, uh, there's a, an interesting um, poem by a guy named Spirella who said, one ship sails east, because you were talking about sailing. Now, think about this. This is really interesting for every one of your businesses. One ship sails east and one ship sails west as the very same breezes blow. It's the set of the sail, not the gale, that bids them where to go. All right, everyone stand up. Let's go stand up. We've changed the session. I have you for three straight hours. <laughs> All right. I have made a commitment to a dear friend. Any baseball fans here? Baseball? All right. Now, I'm from the great city of Atlanta, and there's a guy named Bobby Cox who's been an old friend of mine. He retired a few years ago. He was the manager of the, uh, the Atlanta Braves, won World Series, you know, after coaching for 72 years. But um, it's another story. And Bobby and I have a bet. You are number 43 in my bet. I've got seven more to go. Here's what I want to do. I want everyone to raise their right hand, okay, and repeat after me. All right, sit down. That's 43. When I get to 50, I got a dinner at Bones, which is a really great restaurant in Atlanta. Hey, look, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist about my Braves. I'm also an optimist about what has happened over the, world, over the years, okay, to land title, to real estate, to our economy. I am an optimist. But when you go back to those best practices, those best practices are probably things that many of you veterans have done over the years, but maybe you forgot. Or maybe you're not doing number three anymore. You've got to revisit it. Because in times of change, in times of challenge, you've got to raise the bar and be better than ever before. I, was, I thought I was the greatest optimist in the history of optimists. A number of years ago, many years ago, we did a consulting project for a guy named Gussie Bush. He was then the chairman of the board of Anheuser-Busch and the owner of what baseball team? Anyone? Cardinals, the Cardi Birds. I thought I was the greatest optimist in the history of the world. This guy at 92 married his 19-year-old secretary. There's more. There's more. They bought a house next to an elementary school. That's optimism. So businesses have gone from distinction to extinction. Businesses have gone from and careers have as well, because we couldn't deal with change. For example, how many of you have been, how many, how many people flew into this marvelous conference? Raise your hand. On Eastern Airlines. <laughs> Why not Eastern, sir? Why didn't you fly in on Eastern? It didn't serve this city. Eastern doesn't serve any city. <laughs> now, they were the number one carrier. You want a candy shot? Go, go ahead. Okay, don't, don't bother me anymore. Uh, uh, no. no. <laughs> Eastern Airlines was the number one carrier in the United States, the number four carrier in the world, and they are gone, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I'm going to date some of you folks in this room. How many of you regularly go out to dinner with your families? Come on, raise your hand. To Howard Johnson's. Howard Johnson's was the number one multi-unit restaurant in growth in 1969. They had, and they were innovative. They had alternative channels of distribution. They had Howard Johnson's on toll roads, the New Jersey Turnpike. And oh, by the way, before there was a hard rock and t-shirts, and before there was a cracker barrel with stuff in the gift shop, Howard Johnson's had a gift shop, and they sold peanut brittle and candy. Howard Johnson's had 3,200 restaurants entering the 70s. 3,200 restaurants. Ladies and gentlemen, with the exception of 300 hotels, Howard Johnson's today has 53 restaurants left. Bless you.
and keep you away from me. Okay. <laughs> Do you believe in strategic planning? Do you know what kind of strategic plan you've got to have to go from 2,000 restaurants to 53? We're talking about resource allocation. Distinction or extinction. Look at this shot. Oh, my goodness. Do you know that now 19% of Kentucky fried chicken is Kentucky grilled chicken? That's about adjusting to change. You see, what happened was, some of you may remember, 19, 20 years ago, 19 or 20 years ago, Johns Hopkins University had a study. And it said fried food is going to kill you. And all of a sudden, fried food consumption really went down. Why? Because most, most of us don't want to die. Fried food. And the Kentucky Fried Chicken Company changed their marketing name from Kentucky Fried Chicken to KFC. Because they were hoping our kids would grow up not knowing what the F word. <laughs> the different F word. The F word stands for. But think about that. Going from fried chicken to grilled chicken is nothing more than adapting and adjusting to change. And that's all it is. So by the same token, water. I am I'm the longest running retainer-based consultant in Coca-Cola's history. Uh, it's, we're going on our 21st year. I think they forgot about us and they still keep paying, so I wouldn't repeat this story. I'll, I'll tell you a shocking story. My oldest son, Eric, 29, is with Coca-Cola. He's a junior executive. I have consulted to Coke for 21 years. I've got a parking space. They've sent my family out to Australia for an assignment in the UK. And, the, we've been, and I'm, you know, kind of a, been a fixture around the building. I, my, my ID expires. So I go to the front desk, the big marble rotunda. My son's name is Eric. And I check in and say, I'm going to get a paper pass because I'm supposed to get a new ID. 21 years, folks. And the receptionist looks at me and goes, Blumenthal, are you related to Eric? My life is now over. <laughs> Look at this. How many of you, when you were kids, drank water out of a water hose? And you're still here. I mean, come on. That, you see, you're in the wrong business. Land title, it's a healthy business and, you know, coming back, obviously. But the water business, can you imagine that? Can you imagine your grandparents thinking about someone going to a convenience store and paying a buck twenty-five for a bottle of water, then you pee it out and you buy another? What a business! That's an amazing business. So I had the pleasure of, of um, moderating the debate at Coca-Cola 11 years ago, pro-water or no water. Because Coke wasn't sure if they wanted to get in the water business. You see, they, they came up with this idea. If we go in the water business, that will show our inability to sell soft drinks better. So you had the guys that were in favor of water. And then you had the group called H2NO. True story. And they debated. And one of the groups, okay, the group that was pro-water showed a video on a Delta airplane. You know, Coke is a big uh, sponsor of Delta, so they, they got a plane, they got some passengers, and they went through this. And here was the movie that said, 1986, and they showed a flight attendant walking down the hallway. And here were the orders, Coke, 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 Diet Coke, Diet Coke, 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 Coffee, Coffee, Water, Juice, Coke, Coke, Water, Coke, 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 Coke. And then they flashed a sign that said, 2001, flight attendant and people in the aisle. And here are the orders, Water, 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 Water. Diet Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Coke, 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 Diet Coke, Diet Coke, juice, 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 water, 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 water. We've changed. Our perception has changed. You know, go to a supermarket. I know that's not your business, but watch a consumer. You see every consumer pick up a can or a jar, and they turn it around and look at the ingredients as if they know what anything is other than cholesterol, sodium, and sugar. But we do because... But we've changed through education. It's an ever process. So what I'm doing is in the next three hours, I'm only joking. I know that you're, you know, you, you know okay. but, and I saw, I saw my friend Cornelia before giving you the two minute, that's like the two minute warning. When my, my time starts right now, because I really, I, this is just an intro. Well, bottom line is it's about education. So what I want to do is I want to take you through a journey. Start at 30,000 feet and then land this graph because in the true spirit of what Michelle said earlier, I'm going to throw some ideas at you to think about. And my viewpoint is whether you take one or 50, that's up to you, but don't take the idea. Go back to your office and put that brochure or put that note or put that recap on your shelf and go back to business as usual. Because I will tell you we are living in a world where the best way to describe our world and your business is business as unusual. 
And ladies and gentlemen, there's only one rule in business today. And that one rule is, there are no rules. And, uh, you know, it's not the same land title business you came in. We have a little thing coming up here. It says automatic updates. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. So let me come back in the back of the room and get the harmonica. Well, you know, speaking of technology, anybody read the USA Today? Today? This morning? The story about the factory of the future? Technology. The factory of the future will have two employees, a man and a dog. Seriously. The man will be there to feed the dog. The dog will be there to bite the man if he touches the equipment. Oh, Alexander Graham Bell. Think about how far we've come. By the same token, the Berlin Wall came down. Russia went from a powerhouse to a powder puff. We put a man on the moon. We cloned life in a test tube. We transplanted hearts, kidneys, and a world of an instant communication. There was almost a change that happened to a client of mine on Monday. Most, one of the most interesting assignments in my career as a consultant. For months, I've been sitting at a table moderating a dialogue with two bitter enemies at the table. Coca-Cola and Pepsi. In the dialogue for six months, two words, Mayor Bloomberg. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Think about the change that would have happened if the Supreme Court didn't overrule his decision. It's being appealed now, folks. Mandating that if you go to a food service establishment, you cannot drink any beverage, order any beverage over 16 ounces. Now, that may seem like an interesting point to you. And I believe in health and I believe in wellness. I also believe that maybe we ought to get some parental guidance. I also believe we ought to get some self-discipline. I also believe we ought to understand moderate. That's all up to us. The biggest culprit in childhood obesity and obesity may be parents. Okay? And I'm not going to get into that philosophical debate, but if that ordinance passed, I was in Arkansas last week at the governor's conference, and I will tell you, governors and mayors all around the country are not only thinking about soft drinks, they think about confectionery and ice cream and sugar-based coffee. That would be a dramatic change in our world. That would probably make us totalitarian. So you see lots of changes. Now look at your changes. American Land Title Association. Here, some of them, the housing crisis, the banking crisis, real estate closing volume consolidation, claims and liabilities, public perception of the industry, cyber theft, cyber security, challenges of the Dodd-Frank Act. This is an interesting quote. I got this from the Harvard Law, okay, on the Dodd-Frank. Ushering in a breathtaking amount of changes that will result in fundamental shifts in the legal, regulatory, and policy landscape affecting every aspect of our financial markets from consumer credit to proprietary trading and the entire real estate land. These are all changes. And oh, by the way, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. These changes are going to keep on happening. And you'll sit around and talk about it, but it gets back down to the threshold question. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to be a change catalyst or change agent? How are you going to rise above it? You realize the reason why Coke and Pepsi stopped Mayor Bloomberg in the city of New York was not because of Coke and Pepsi. It was because of their association, the National Restaurant Association, and the ABI, Beverage Institute, and on and on. Coke and Pepsi went to them with RC Cola, Dr. Pepper, and all that, and the candy people like Mars and M&Ms and Nestle and others, and folks in the baking area, and said, time out. Go read a book written in 1949, folks. It's called 1984 by George Orwell. It talks about government mandating what we eat and what we don't eat, who we marry, who we don't marry. Oh, by the way, who we can isolate and kill. Now, I'm not being political here. I'm just telling you that we're in a world of rapid changes. You've got to figure out a way to rise above it. So change is one single undeniable reality of our world and our lives. It's the heartbeat of our existence. It's the speed of change today. Now, he, he, I'm going to get away from these slides in a minute, but I, I felt it was important to set the stage 30,000 feet. Critical mass means when 50 million Americans have adopted something. Now, look at the speed here. The telephone took 25 years. The television took 13 years. Cable television took 10 years. The Internet took five years to get to critical mass. Facebook, two years, and Twitter, less than one year. We are absolutely changing instantaneously. You want to see some changes? Wait a second. That says that if we're not smart, that's why the ALTA, 
providing you the educational resources I saw on the slides and what I've spoken to Michelle and others about and, and reading the website, that's your key to success, folks. You're going to have to be smarter and better and faster and swifter and raise the bar constantly or you will find it pass you by. It's real simple. So, every once in a while in the world of business, we have a word that's in vogue. You know, uh, remember the word um, proactive years ago. Everybody was proactive. We were putting our plans together. We were proactive this. Now I think it's something that you use to clear up pimples or something. I don't know. It's different, different proactive, I guess. But we were proactive. How about this one? Empowerment. Remember, years ago, we were empowering. We got multitasking now. I'm going to give you this next word. It's a word that was used 15, 20 years ago. Joel Barker wrote a book about it. When I give you this word, I'm going to raise my hand, and I want you to go, ooh, because that's the power of this word. Paradigm. Ooh, this is a good group. This is a good group. Okay. What's a paradigm? Is that like... Um, I want a quarter so I get a paradigm and a nickel. What is a pa Anyone? Well, now, you heard my introduction. I spent some time uh, <laughs> in a college classroom, Michigan State being one of them. I know many of you kind of wondered, how does a guy named Ira Blumenthal teach at Notre Dame? Not complicated. When I get to South Bend, I change my name to Irish O. Blumenthal. <laughs> I was one of the candidates for Pope, by the way. <laughs> now, there's never been a Jewish Pope. You know, what? There was? The first, oh, the first Pope, oh, the first one. Sorry, <laughs> and he was the guy in charge. No, 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 he wasn't in charge. His wife was in charge. <laughs> yeah, you shorten the name, though. What was it, Francisco? Francesco. Oh, oh, manja, manja. My wife is Methodist. I am Jewish. We invented a religion called Methodish. And I have become the only rabbinister of the Methodish faith. That's called change. Paradigm paralysis versus paradigm pioneering. Paradigm simply means a mindset, the way you look at the world, your viewpoint. People become paralyzed by their paradigms. If you want to grow, you've got to be a paradigm pioneer. You've got to invent and create. You know, it's just really kind of interesting. When I was a kid growing up, many of you can share this, the paradigm of dating was boys ask girls out. Way before female careerism. Today it's perfectly acceptable for a high school girl to ask a high school boy out to the prom. Or a businesswoman to take a businessman out to a business lunch and pick up the tab. That, that paradigm has evolved. So, see, here's what happened. Most people in organizations change because they're forced to. We buy a smoke detector after a fire. You've got to get ahead of it, folks. How many of you have been in this industry for over a year? Raise your hand. Come on, let's go. Over five years. Ten years. My God. Nobody leaves. Over 20 years. Still about, okay, we can keep on going. I don't want to embarrass you people who have been here 60 years. <laughs> Like, what was that uh, vacation at Bernie? There's a few people you just prop up in the corner and drag them back to the re registration, take them to the next conference. <laughs> uh, yes, most of you, and how many of you women started working in the industry when you were five years old? Okay, I got it. I said, women, sir. I'll try it again. How many of you women? What's your name? Hi. Ira, let me call your name. Listen to this. You want to sell me something, don't you, Roger? Where are you, where are you from? Kansas. From Kansas. My wife is from Missouri, although her mother and father say that they're from Missouri. You could help me with that during break, okay? But, you know, the reality is paradigm is a mindset. And, oh, by the way, you want to grow that business, you've got to change the mindset. So here's what I want you to do. I'd like you to read the first yellow line, just the first yellow line. Every organization says it wants to change. Few can do it. Sir, would you read the next? Every young business starts off as a natural opportunity for change. Few can sustain it. Would you read the next line, please? Every organization claims they are agents of change. And few can substantiate it. Everyone talks about how committed they are to change. Few can prove it. This is about culture, folks. That's what this is. This is about culture. If I'm not mistaken, I read something that I believe you wrote that talked about strategy and culture. 
culture is more important. You've got to have a culture of change. And great companies do. Now, it's not always easy to change. So here are the three things. We're going to kind of bring this airplane down to about 10,000 feet. Only three things you can do with change. You can ignore it. You can adapt to it. Or you can make other changes. If you ignore change, you will die. It's real simple. Every company that's gone or every career that's gone is because they just ignored it. It won't happen here. It can't happen here. And it does happen here. There's only one rule in business, and that one rule is there are no rules. When I was a young kid, I guess you can tell by my voice, I'm from the deep south. <laughs> south shore of Long Island, y'all. When I was a young boy, my mom and dad took us to Manhattan to see the trade towers go up. I would have bet my life they'd be here hundreds and hundreds of years. There's only one rule. There are no rules. So let's take a little look at this. You can ignore change. History is, the graveyard is full of organization. How many people here used a travel agent to fly to this conference? One. And you got, what, 200 in the order? One out of 200. They don't exist anymore. Their business has changed. Blockbuster has no more buildings. Why? This Blockbuster now is working on changing their business to an online program. And it, ha it happens all the time. You can't let it happen in your industry. You can't let it happen in your industry. And the only way to do that is to get ahead. So ignore change, you die. React to change, you survive. But here is the big one, folks. Make other changes. You be a change a agent. You be a change catalyst. You be a paradigm pioneer. Be innovative. Event. Take shot. Invent. Take shots. Only way you're going to grow. Every great work of art, industry, and science came about because someone took a shot and someone tried something. I told you about Coca-Cola and water. I've got a relationship with an interesting guy. I don't spend a lot of time with him anymore, but um, he used to help run a foundation for Ted Turner years ago. Amazing human being. When I would meet with Ted, I felt like I was with Henry Ford. He's such a visionary guy. Ted Turner will tell the story about how he, one day he got home and he turned the news on at 6 o'clock. This is pre-CNN. And there was a national disaster. And it all of a sudden dawned on me, why do I have to wait till 6 o'clock? The paradigm of news, some of you remember this, was news comes on at 6 and 11, and then some innovative TV producer said, let's have 10 o'clock news. Remember that? And Ted said, well, that doesn't make any sense. That paradigm, I don't think he used the word paradigm, but, but that model doesn't work. Things happen by the second in our world. Why not 24-hour a day, seven-day week news? So he decided not to use his own money at first, and he went to Wall Street. And nobody bought it. Nobody thought that 24-hour a day, seven-day week news was a good idea. Why would anyone want to watch it? No entertainment value, so he took his own money and created CNN. Broke the mold, broke the model. Where would we be today without CNN? The generals in the war look at CNN to figure out where the enemy is. You just hope the enemy is not watching CNN. That wouldn't be good. Harley Davidson was about going bankrupt. They reinvented the model. You see, the model for, I'm a branding guy. That's my background, a lot of brands. Harley Davidson's brand, identity, as well as image was body piercing, tattoos, hell's angels, and on and on and on. You got to be a macho guy to be on a Harley. That wasn't working. Today, almost 18% of Harley owners are women and growing. And you could be a banker, a lawyer, a professional in land title. It's okay to now. They reinvented themselves. I have a friend who is the president and founder, well, he just retired, who is the founder of Quizno Subs. He lives in Denver. And he is the president of a fierce motorcycle gang called Jub, J-U-B, J-U-B, Jewish Urban Bikers. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. Everybody, put your hands out straight. Put both hands out straight. Come on. All right, when I say three, we're going to make noise as if we're riding on a motorcycle made in Japan. Made in Japan. Come on, get those hands out there. Let's go. One, two, three. Okay. A-L-T-A members, put your hands high on the hog. When I say three, let's do the hog. One, two, three. Boom. Boom. But that company has changed dramatically. Okay. Haven't been a, well, president of a division of Sara Lee 100 years ago, haven't been a consultant for 20 some odd years, author, academician, college classrooms and other things. See a lot, read a lot, hear a lot of business stories. I will tell you, this is my most favorite business story in the history of my life. And I kind of live it a little bit because I'm in the environment. It's something that maybe some of you may have heard a little bit about, but this is a change story that I hope you don't forget. And then maybe go home 
and back to your offices Monday morning 9 a.m. and figure out a way you might be able to change something in your business and be innovative. You see, there was a guy named Waddy, W-O-D-D-Y Pratt. You would not know Waddy Pratt. But Waddy Pratt has a statue erected of him in the marble rotunda at Coca-Cola's headquarters. Waddy Pratt was a sales guy 60 years ago. In fact, he passed away about five years ago, probably was the only guy in the history of Coca-Cola to have an office up until 82 years old and came in religiously once a year. But that's another, another story, okay? But Waddy Pratt was a sales guy, a peddler in California, and he had a little tiny customer, and the customer's name was Ray. Now, Ray owned three restaurants. He bought those three restaurants under the terms that you will not change the name of our family restaurants. He, brought, he bought the restaurants from the McDonald's Brothers. Three restaurants, not a chain. A couple of links, right? So these guys, you got a supplier, a peddler of Coke, and Ray Kroc, three restaurant unit operator. Now, remember when you're early in your career, you sat down at a conference like this, or you went out for a drink with friends, and you talked about, when you're young, what you want to be when you grow up. Oh, I want to be vice president, I want to be president, I want to be this, I want to, right? Well, we've all well done that. Well, Ray Kroc and Waddy Pratt, the sales guy from Coke, talked about what they, what they wanted to be when they grew up. And Ray Kroc said to Waddy Pratt, I really love this McDonald's concept I bought, and I'm going to make it a chain. My goal is 50. But man, if I can get to 100, I mean, God's been good. How about you, Waddy? All right, are you coming after me, sir? <laughs> who, who is that guy? Do we know him? He's kind of a big deal. Okay, let me see your badge. Sir, you're in the specialty gift conference. That's too... Uh, <laughs> so he said, Waddy, what do you want to do when you grow up? Young sales guy from Coke, 60 years ago. I want to be the most famous sales guy in the history of my company. I want to be famous. So, as you may recall, the more you drink, the more profound you become. And they started having a couple of beers. And in front of them, I have seen the newspaper, folks. It's, it's mounted in the restored office of Robert Woodruff, the modern-day chairman of Coca-Cola. Bless you. Sacramento Times. And the headline said, America moving toward female careerism, more women in the workforce, and two car families. How many of you grew up in a one-car one family? Okay. You younger folks, go to the old neighborhoods and you'll see one garage. Because America, for many years, was one was a one-income bit. My mom stayed home, dad came home from work, and she got the car for shopping or Saturday. So Ray Kroc and Waddy talked about females in the market, more double, double car families. You see, that's what you have to do. You all raised your hands when you said you've been in the industry five years, ten years, etc. Think about where your industry is going. That's the old Wayne Gretzky, you know, where the puck is going, right? By the way, all these slides are being left behind, okay? So if you need any of these, just uh, ask Michelle or, you know, or whomever, okay? We'll certainly let us share it to you. And if you use it and get money for it, we'll sue you. It's just a, it's a simple process. You know, litigation is just a way of our life. Okay, so now they got an idea, a change idea. What if we put a driveway up to the side of our restaurant and blow a hole in the wall? What if we, I know some of you younger folks think that God gave us 11 commandments. The 10 we know that Moses got, and the 11th was all fast food restaurants shall have drive through No, he didn't do that. Somebody had to invent that. Interestingly enough, you are in the city that debates the drive through This is the base of, of Sonic. Sonic claims to have that first, but Sonic had that car hop. McDonald's had the drive through Here's what happened. So they went to any, I, I shouldn't, you guys lose something over here? What's going on? You dropped your, oh, you dropped your phone. So this way, now you can't make calls while Iris speaks. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, and you can't, you know, we get to... I was going to tell the Twitterverse how great you are. Oh, let's find the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what happens. I'm going to be a little bit hesitant about it. How many bankers are there here? Any bankers? Okay. I, I love you. This next line is not going to be banker friendly, but that's okay. So they went to the visionary bankers of Southern California with the idea for a drive through restaurant for $983. I have seen the canceled check. And every visionary banker said, 
Mr. Kroc, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Why would anyone ever want to eat food in a car? A-L-T-A, if you've ever eaten food in a car, please raise your hand. Oh, there's a guy in the back not raised. You are apathetic. That's, America does not, you guys, one more time. How many people have eaten food in a car? Thank you. Dashboard dining is the way of our world. I remember, I'm old enough to remember that there were no cup holders in cars years ago. You went to Kmart and you bought the maroon thing and you stuck it into your window and you put the glass there. Remember that? Yeah. And then... If you open the door too fast, there wasn't even lids then. You younger folks in a very primitive society. <laughs> then, then we get not only cup holders, but my friend Jesus Delgado Jenkins, the, the CEO of a, of a 7-Eleven, he came up with an idea. Since they market the big gulp, expandable cup holders, right, for the 44-gallon drum. We were in dashboard dining, okay? So the reality is, so no banks, got it. So Wadi Pratt said, I got an idea. I can probably get the company to put us on a train. Again, younger folks, trains were things that people got on, not just those around Christmas trees. But so, so now, and they got on a train, and they went to Atlanta, and they met with Robert Woodruff, who was the longest running chairman in the history of Coca-Cola, the guy that put a Coca-Cola bottle in every GI's hand in World War II. They made Coca-Cola international, a revered name in Atlanta. Emory University is endowed by him, etc. And they met with the chairman of the board. And Ray Kroc said, I got this great idea. And Robert Woodruff looked at Ray Kroc in one of the most famous moments in American business and said, Ray, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard about. But if you're right, it will change the face of this industry. So on behalf of Coca-Cola, we've decided not to loan you the $983. Gotta remember this is 60 years ago. Coca-Cola will give you, and I've seen the cancel check in Robert Woodruff's restored office on North Avenue at Coke headquarters. We will give you the $983 in one condition. You look me in the eye, you shake my hand, and you promise me that you, whether you get to 50 restaurants or 100 restaurants, you will be an exclusive Coca-Cola restaurant chain for the rest of humanity. That's a long contract, folks. And they shook hands. And I will tell you today, there are 35,600 plus McDonald's around the world. There is no contract between those companies. It was all in a handshake. And they all exclusively pour Coke. A buddy of mine, anyone here from Michigan? You know, you know the name Illich, Mike Illich, Mary and Illich? Okay. Mike and Mary and Illich are the saviors of Detroit. Little Caesars, they own Little Caesar, they own the Detroit Red Wings, the Detroit Tigers, et cetera, et cetera. My buddy Mike built Comerica Park a number of years ago, big baseball stadium for the Tigers, and put it in a McDonald's. But he was on a Coke contract at Comerica. When he changed to Pepsi, McDonald's folded 10 and moved out of the stadium. It's an amazing story, but the story is not just a great American story about trust and handshakes, it's about change. It's about change. And oh, by the way, on your own levels and your own little businesses, okay, you can figure out something that might be innovative or visionary. So let's go through, land this craft, some of the things that I have found in my career great change agents seem to do. First of all, focus. Focus. And maybe sacrifice. You cannot be all things to all, all people. Figure out a way, what do I want to accomplish in 2013 or next quarter or next period or next week or next day? Figure out, a, and, and by the way, change does not have to be lightning bolts and claps of thunder. It can be as little as answering the phone a different way. Hallmark Cards, a number of years ago, we participated in a planning session, and they, the challenge was to come up with one word that defines Hallmark Cards. One word to move their business. And you know what the word was? Best. When you care enough to give the very best. And then they went on in their mission statement and look at their website. We only use the best paper, the best ink, only the best franchisees, only the best site selection, only the best writers. That's their focus. Focus and sacrifice. Let me give you a food example. Burger King is focused on 18 to 34-year-old men, period, done, end of story. Ladies, they'll take your money, but they're not marketing to you. Watch their advertising. It's all about burly men with chains pulling trucks or that funky Burger King peeking in your window, right? If you look at their menu mix, 
Burger King sells Whoppers, leaded Coke, and fries. Now, I say that because Diet Coke is skewed female. Now, men drink it, but it's skewed female. So they have sacrificed women and children. Burger King's focus. McDonald's, totally different focus. Moms, kids, families. That's why this playground, every place you go, that's why your spokesperson's a clown, and that's why they sell more salad than any other fast food joint in the world. Why? Because mom eats the salad while the kids have the chicken Mc, 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 McMaggots or whatever they call it. You know, whatever. I guess anyone here from... <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, look at this. My goodness, how'd that happen? Focus. Seven pillars. I would be very upset if I sat there in, in your place saying, and here are the 143 pillars of best practices. I think it's time to find another industry. But seven. It's not difficult. You see, we created life in a test tube. We put a man on the moon. We transplanted a heart. Committing to seven pillars of best practices is easy compared to that stuff. It really is. Focus. Another best practice, okay, as, is, is a business plan. Have a business plan. I know you have a business plan. You might have a contingency plan. You might have a three-year plan or a five-year plan or a marketing plan. But why not a business plan that might be two pages or three pages long focused on the logical and likely changes in your industry? Those of you that have been around 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you're already feeling, whether it be government or whether competitors said or whatever it is, figure out what should we be pre preparing for. We did a, uh, a big project 15 years ago, 16 years ago for Norm Brinker. Anyone from Dallas here? Oh, you know, you know the Brinker organization? He passed away a few years ago. And we sat down with Norman and his group. They own Chili's and South of the Border and Nacho Mama's and Maggiano's and, uh, um, oh, what is it? Uh, Macaroni Grill, or they, they just spun that off. We sat down, and they gave us an assignment to figure out what the next 10 to 15 years would require them to do and change their business. And we came up with a conclusion. Double income families. Nobody's at home cooking. And we said to them, watch Olive Garden. And Olive Garden was just putting in these 10-minute parking spaces for takeout food. Oh, by the way, look at the restaurant industry today. You go to a sit-down restaurant, there are five, six, seven parking spaces for takeout food and maybe one or two for handicap. You get a better parking space if you get takeout than if you're handicapped. Well, they refused to accept that 15 years ago. We're a restaurant. You come to Chili's, you buy your, you know, you get your broccoli bites, potato skins, and your Long Island iced teas, and you behave like a restaurant dining guest. Well, look at Chili's today. The Chili's to go sign is almost bigger than the Chili sign. The business has changed, okay? You gotta have a plan though. Figure out in your mind what's logically gonna happen to our industry. The best plan I ever saw in my life was written by my son, Eric. My son, Eric, we were living in Chicago. We just moved to Atlanta. My, my son was nine years old and said, Dad, um, I need 50 bucks, I wanna buy a CD player. I said, son, you're old enough now to do a little work and you know, you bankers, you know the term matching funds. You raise five bucks and I'll give you five bucks. I'm a consultant, I even consult to my kids, right? Go up to your room, Eric, and write a business plan. Four or five things you're gonna do to raise money. Best plan I've ever seen in my life. It's in one of my books, actually. Ways to make money. Shovel, S-H-U-V-E-L, shovel snow. Now, we just moved from Chicago to Atlanta. Shoveling snow in Atlanta, not a big revenue source. Do chores, that was good. My wife was very upset with strategy number three, bet on football games. But here is the big one. We went to Sports Authority, and my younger son, Jeff, found five bucks by the cashier. So when Eric got home, he added to his business plan ways to make money, find it on the ground. <laughs> American Land Title Association, you're not going to find success in times of change on the ground. It's going to be by plan. And I don't care if the plan's on a napkin. Figure out what you're going to do to step above this. What you're going to do to avert this. Maybe ways that you can educate your clients on what's coming on the hill. Whatever it is. I don't know. You know your business better than I. Okay? Communication critical. You've got, to, you've got to raise the bar. And now, with everything that we have from a social media standpoint, electronic communication, there should be no reason in the world that we can't communicate. Although I do believe that we're hiding behind email and we're hiding behind text. I, don't, I have my last one is going to college as a freshman on a basketball scholarship. And if I call Ryan five times in five minutes, he will never answer. If I text him, he will text me back in 13 seconds, which kind of tells me he has no interest in talking to me. You know, it's interesting, though. My middle son, Jeff, who lives in Washington, D.C., in the medic, he's in the orthopedic uh, trauma business at Fairfax Hospital, 
um, when he was at Rhodes College in Memphis, they had parent orientation. And I'll never forget, this is about seven years ago, the president got up and said, ladies and gentlemen, we're so glad that your kids are here. And tonight, in honor of your, your kids, our incoming freshman class, they're all going to be invited to my house to have a great old Memphis barbecue dinner. From, anyone from Memphis here? You ever hear of Memphis? It's a little town. It's somewhere in Tennessee. Yeah. So, and then he said, when they get to the gates of my home, my wife and her friends will be giving them postcards with a beautiful picture of Rhodes College and a pen. And it'll be pre-stamped. And they'll write, dear mom and dad, thank you for affording me the pleasure of going to college. And we'll mail it to you. And then he said, seven years ago, and ladies and gentlemen, you'll probably be home the next day or two and you'll get that mail in your post, you know, in your mailbox. And I promise you, that will be the only piece of mail you will get in the next four years from your kids. When I went to school, it was letters. It was collect phone call on Sunday. Now, I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. It's change, communication, lifelong learning. The reason that you're here, besides networking and meeting old friends, is to raise the bar and keep on learning. You were deceived in high school. Some teacher said success in the, is in the hands of the learned, L-E-A-R-N-E-D, not. Success is in the hands, Alta, success is in the hands of the learning. It's a continuous process. Find something at this conference and take it back with you and do something about it. It's about learning. The only thing I refuse to learn is how to change the digital clock in my car radio. No, it's true. True story. My wife and I are driving to a dinner about a month ago, and she turns to me, oh, my God, we're an hour late. I said, nope, not in this car. In this car, you must subtract 60 minutes until daylight savings time, because Ryan is at college, okay? So lifelong learning. The old rule of risk was, what's the risk I'm taking if I do this? Ask yourself now, what's the risk I'm taking if I don't do this? Man, that's a big risk. What's the risk I'm taking? I don't want to waste my time. You know, it's interesting. I am a believer, so let me see. I got it right here. Frank. What does that say? What's that? It says, Title Insurance and Settlement Company Best Practices. This is what people are reading on the planes. All of us got this on Delta. I don't know why. You did a great job of marketing. No. This is what you call wife in charge. As I was leaving, she said, why don't you read their best practices on the airplane? I said, but I, I just bought Playboy. No, I didn't say that, I swear. But, uh, <laughs> what's the risk? You got a greater risk if you don't do this, if you don't think about ways to raise the bar, okay? I'm not gonna look at you because in about 14 minutes or so, you're gonna raise your two fingers and I'm, not gonna, I'm just gonna ignore you because I'm having a good time, okay? Moving on, be the best. We said it earlier. Don't just be good, figure out a way how do we in our own businesses raise the bar and be the best? And if you ask yourself that question, take a step back and look at your own businesses as if you were a consultant to you. you got to market and sell as if your life depends on it because you, it does. Figure out a way to be better, faster, swifter, raise the bar. I mentioned my buddy who owns the Detroit Tigers. I did not know Ted Turner at that time, so I had to fly my kids to Detroit, all three of my sons threw out first pitches in, in Detroit. Okay, two in the old stadium, Morning America. But the memory that, that's really astounding was when the Tigers were hosting the Baltimore Orioles, Cal Ripken Jr. was on the team. And before the game, Cal put balls on a rubber tee. <laughs> and hit them into a net. You know, tees, how many people here have had, had kids play tee ball? Anybody? I'm coaching tee ball. I, I coach forever. I started my career out. I played a... Uh, I played sport, actually played two sports at the University of Maryland. There's nothing fiercer than a fighting turtle. Just want you all to get that. And, uh, you know, so I, when I finished uh, playing ball, I coached at Maryland for a year, and then I coached at a school called Towson University. Now it's Towson State College. Always coached. So I had three boys, and, um, and I coached all three of the boys, okay? So now, you know, I coached T-ball. I had a little boy named Jason on the team. He was, you know, first grade, kindergarten, whatever it was. And Jason didn't get a hit all season. So finally, the last game of the season, Jason gets up to the tee, clocks the ball into left field, and he runs to first base, and he hits the inside corner of the bag, which is what you teach him, and then he runs directly to third. <laughs> Five years old. Gets tagged out, comes back to the dugout. Coach B, Coach B, he's crying. I said, Jason, we talked about this. We practiced these yes, but my teacher, first grade, said the quickest way between two points is a straight line. <laughs> Not in... Baseball. But raise the bar. So Cal Ripken Jr. hitting the, tee, the balls off a tee. And my son Jeff turns to Ripken. Mr. Ripken, do you hit baseballs off a tee before every game you play? And he said, Jeff, I hit anywhere from 150 to 200 baseballs off a rubber tee into a net before every game I've ever played as a professional athlete. 
And if it rains, I take wiffle balls in the clubhouse. And in the off-season in Reisterstown, Maryland, where he has a farm, I do 500 a day. And then he said something to my son. To this day, and my son is now just turning 26, has never forgotten, and you can't forget. I've got to const and he said this to my son, I've got to constantly raise the bar on my game. Hall of Fame baseball players and Hall of Fame professionals in land title, in the businesses that you're in, bankers, etc., constantly raise the bar. It's about getting better. That's, that's why the best practices are here, to help you get closer to being best. Raising the bar. Moving on. Focus on quality. Don't evolve or dissolve. You've got to embrace technology. Take care of your people. Very important in times of change. Okay? Motivate up the hill. No question about that. Tommy Lasorda has become a friend over the years. Tommy Lasorda. Amazing message. I was with uh, Tommy in, in Arizona many years ago, and my team was going to be playing in the national U-Triple-S-A champ. U-Triple-S-A is an organization for travel baseball. And I was blessed to be a, the manager of a national championship team. And I was stupid enough to come back the following season. I should have just retired, you know, figured, okay, next year we'll do better. You know, we can, you don't do better than the best, okay? And I asked Tommy in Arizona, we were together, gee, I've got this big game coming up on Saturday. Any advice? And he told me something he did with the Dodgers. Whether you're a baseball fan or not, it's a real good message. The Dodgers were playing in the World Series. They were down to the seventh game. And when the, the players came to the locker room, something magical happened. Every one of their jerseys was missing their name on the back of the shirt. And they were all kind of surprised. You've seen all the names on the back of professional athlete shirts. And he said, today you play for the name on the front of the shirt, not the name on the back of the shirt. And that's what great teams do. Got to figure out a way to get your team mobilized and figure out how do we deal with some of the challenges and changes that we're having. Persevere, never quit. Be positive. Be optimistic. Think big. Think big. I got a buddy named Aaron. Anybody here from Chicago? Okay, you know Evanston? Okay, bedroom community outside of Chicago. You get to work by either taking a bus, taking a train, or driving, right? Okay. My buddy Aaron is with an insurance company. Greatest big story, greatest think big story I've ever heard in my life. He gets up in the morning and he walks to the corner and he sees at the corner, getting ready to go on the bus, he sees a little boy with a table. There's a table, a chair, a little boy, and an ugly, scruffy, dirty, filthy, rancid, putrid, disgusting, you get my drift, right? Dog. And next to the dog is a sign, dog for sale, 25 cents. Would you buy a 25 cent dog? Not if it's all nasty. Well, you got to figure 25 cent dog's probably missing a tail or an ear or something like that, right? So he's, he's, a, he's a think big proponent. He said to the little boy, think big, ALTL members, think big, think big. And he said to the boy, take the dog home, wash the dog, scrub him up, fluff him up, put a ribbon around his neck, and raise your price. The boy said, that's a pretty good idea. So now Evan gets off the bus at the end of the day, and there's the boy. There's the table, the chair. Gorgeous little white fluffy Benji looking dog, fluffy white orange ribbon, and a new sign, dog for sale, $10,000. <laughs> so my friend said, I must have done enough damage for the day. Next morning he goes out to go to the bus to go to work and he sees table, chair, no boy, no dog, and the line painted through the sign, <laughs> sold. This is worth being late to work for. So he hunted around for the kid. He found the kid. He said, Sonny, congratulations. Yes, oh, you gave me some great, great information. And I'll never forget that my whole life. And when I get older and I become a professional in the land title business, he didn't really say that. I just shoved that in. It's a, it's a little speaker technique. Um, and I sold my dog. He said, well, congratulations. What did you get for your dog? $10,000. Aaron said, there's no way in God creation anyone would pay you $10,000 cash for that dog. And the little boy said, I didn't take cash. I traded him for two $5,000 cats. <laughs> so in times of change, disturb the peace, Stephen Jobs in his book talked about love to learn to break something. Turn around and look at all the rules and figure out what's still relevant. Some are, some aren't. Some are and some aren't, okay? By the same token, the most important prefix in, in change management is re. Reinvent, redefine, reposition, reevaluate, reengineer, reinvigorate, and on and on. Collaboration, strategic part. That's why you're here. Learn from each other. Figure out something. See, how do you deal with this? Or what are you doing in this social media area? What about marketing? Or what about an employee retention? That's one of the reasons why you're here. That's also about learning. And there's nothing wrong with asking someone for help and maybe giving help as well. ALTL. 
No, 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 no. Let's start again. What's your, I keep on thinking the Atlanta Lawn Tennis Association, by the way. It is, they're out there. They are. They, they do. And you're missing a lot of, a lot of people that were going to come to you are now playing tennis. <laughs> we're going to be talking about the messaging. But no, take a shot. I looked at the workshops and the certification and registration you know, courses here, the best practices. Find one or two or three things and take it back with you and take a shot. Wayne Gretzky once said, I miss 100% of the shots I never take. Anybody here ever coach anything, Little League Youth, anyone? Any coaches? Okay, what do you coach? Soccer, okay. What? Dance, okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Rug rugby. Did you say rugby? Like we're brothers, lacrosse players and rugby guys, you know. They, huh? Rugby with sticks, right. Is it true that rugby, play, uh, rugby players eat their young? <laughs> Anyone else? Any baseball coaches? Anybody? Well, you know, in many parks, okay, um, baseball coaches have a draft. Kids try out and they rate the kids. You've probably seen it with your own kids, right? And then they pick. If you were a coach drafting kids at seven years old or eight years old, what's the first draft pick you'd make? What position? Pitcher. Wrong. Team mom. <laughs> Snack. Come on. We are in Cherokee, North Carolina, playing a national championship game. And before the game, I'm talking to the kids about keys and signals and slide and take and so forth. And I say, okay, boys, any questions? My own son, Ryan, raises and goes, yes, Dad, what's the snack? What's the second position you'd get? See, we're going to be about six over only because we started a little bit late. You know that because I was counting the time. All right, I'm watching you very carefully. What are you guys doing back there? Just sitting and watching? Can you see the slides? Okay. How about a round of applause for okay for our nice friends in the corner here at Cornelius? And Alphonse, okay, they do a great job. The second pick is what? First base? What do you think? Catcher. Catcher? Wrong. Family with a swimming pool. <laughs> Team party? All right, I'm coaching seven-year-old basketball. My son, all three of my boys are college basketball players. Two of them graduated and played college ball in my... My son Ryan was actually Mr. Basketball in Cobb County last year, number one, uh, first team All-State, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm coaching my seven-year-old son, Eric, in Naperville, Illinois. First year playing basketball for a seven-year-old. We are, I, I'm coaching, and I have a perfect record, 0 oh and 7. Those of you who are not sports fans, 0 oh and 7 is not that great. Okay. I come back from the seventh game, and we lose. I look at my son, Eric, and he's crying. And I say to him the words that coaches, be it rugby or dance or anyone, has said for ages. Don't cry. It's only a game. Which, by the way, is an obligatory expression used by losing coaches. But that's another story. Dad, I'm not crying because we lost. This is my first year playing basketball, seven games. I haven't scored a point. And I said, honey, I forgot to tell you. I taught you about boxing one, out of bounds plays, fast break offense. But I never taught you the most important rule in basketball. And A-L-T-A, the most important rule in your business. You cannot score unless you shoot. Eric, in seven games, honey, you haven't taken one shot. Dad forgot to tell you that rule. So next game, I go out of town. I'm in Orlando, Florida. All right, my team is 0-7. I call up. Eric, how do we do? Dad, Dad, we won our first game, 10-8. to eight, And I scored all 10 points. I'm thinking, move over Michael Jordan. We're going to have Air Eric on our shirts, Air Eric on our shoes. We'll be singing, I want to be like Eric. He'll be doing movies with Looney Tunes characters. It'll be great. And then it dawns on me, these kids lose seven games straight while I'm in town. I leave. So I, what did Coach Paul do? My neighbor, my assistant coach. What did Coach Paul do to fire up the team? Oh, Dad, Coach Paul got the flu. Mom, coach the team. Don't, lady, don't clap. My friend from Kansas, would you hold her hands or you sit on your hands, okay? I walk on the court the next week and the women are chanting, we want Kim, we want Kim. Obsessed with execution. Execution is critical in times of change. I, was I guess I shouldn't say Hyatt Hotel. That's probably not appropriate to use a brand, right? So like mentioning Hyatt would probably not be a good thing. So this is not a Hyatt Hotel story. I am in Irvine, California, staying at a hotel. And I get up in the morning to go exercise. 
payback from college athletics. You see, when you play college sports, you make an investment. And then when you get to be my age, the interest is compounded daily. So I go to work out. I have two replacement hips and replacement shoulder. And I pull my USA Today from under the door. You've all done that, right? Do you ever do that in your underwear? I hope the door doesn't close behind your hands. That's it. You always, if you go to enough hotels, you see arms come out. <laughs> and it's not the USA Today. It's the Japanese Times. I look down the hallway. Everyone's got the USA Today. I look the hall. Everyone's got, except for me. I call the manager, and I'm not upset. I want to find out why. I said, Mr. Blumenthal, terribly sorry. We've got guests in from Japan. And we thought in the name of hospitality to provide them with newspapers they, they know and love. Great idea. Lousy execution. It turned out that the, the guys from Japan got the USA Today and the Jewish kids from New York. We got the Japanese Times. What I'm saying is execution is critical more than ever before. Endless possibilities. Share. I don't you're here. Have fun. Fall in love. I've been blessed in my career to have made, re made friends and relationships with everyone from Debbie Fields, who founded Mrs. Fields Cookies, to guys like Tommy Lasorda. I was even, oh, I, you think you have a tough job? I was Colin Powell's opener. I had to travel with General Powell. You know what it's like to be the 8 o'clock speaker when General Powell is the 9 o'clock speaker? Number one, everyone comes in late. And number two, nobody hears anything you have to say. So I'm with him at Marriott's Palm Desert Resort in Palm Springs. And General Powell and his lovely wife, Alma, General Powell turned to me and said, Ira, what's your goals and objectives today? I said, General, when the audience leaves the auditorium, I want them to say to themselves, now who was that army guy that followed Ira? <laughs> he did not laugh. <laughs> Mario Andretti, Tommy Lasorda, Debbie Fields, and I can go on and on and on with folks I've been around. Ted, passion. Success is about passion. And man, if you can turn around and make passion part of your culture, Raise the bar and face changes, it'll happen. So, change is next X. We start off with change inevitable, growth is optional. I came out here tooting this harmonica. And I was quoting 20th century philosopher Bob Dylan. And I said, there's a battle outside that's raging. It'll shake your windows. It'll rattle your walls. Ah, the times they are changing. What I didn't share with you was the last stanza, the most important stanza in that poem and that song written in 1963, which still resonates. Ah, the line it is drawn, the curse it is cast, the first one now might later be last. Ah, the times they are changing. So, in closing, if you stop me in the hallway and said, Ira, is there any, anything else you could share about dealing with change, focus, raise the bar, take a shot. We talked about a lot of those things, okay? I, I would say don't grow old. Now, I don't mean chronological age. Everybody knows somebody who's 80 years old with energy and vim and vigor and open-mindedness. And you also know a 30-year-old who's over. Youth is about the heart and the head. Kids color outside the lines all the time and make up games. So my viewpoint is this. To close, I'd like to use words from that same futurist Bob Dylan. May your hands always be busy. May your feet always be swift. May you have a strong foundation as the winds of changes shift. May your heart always be joyful and your song, may the American Land Title Association song, always be sung. And may you stay forever young, forever young, forever young. May you stay forever young. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was just what we needed, Ira. Thank you. That was fantastic, and I think it's it's fabulous, and it's a great way to. Uh, really launch us into the bulk of our program at the Business Strategies Conference. Uh, we're starting with professional development sessions right now. They're all in the meeting rooms downstairs. So you'll go down the stairs with the escalators for the meeting rooms for professional development. Uh, we have lunch coming up. And uh, I see that Camille put up the conference proceedings. Thank you. So anybody that wants to get their materials ahead of time, get your QR code scanners out. After the first professional development session, we're going to have lunch, and we would like to thank our lunch sponsor today. 
Fidelity National Title Insurance. We appreciate your partnership and support of ALTA. Thank you for lunch. And uh, during lunch, we're going to have roundtable discussions. And of course, our roundtable discussions this meeting are going to be focused on pillars of the best practices. So you can find different topic tables on best practices. So seek out conversations that you want to engage with other attendees and enjoy your lunch. And in the uh, forever young category, I want to share a message that was tweeted by Andrew. Title insurance and fun. Two words closely associated while at ALTA BSC. Bring it on. Thanks, Andrew. Enjoy your professional development.